Jake's on the wall. Should I start over now that we're recording or it's fine? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, can I get a motion for a, the approval of the August 9th, 2021 minutes? Molly, they'll be available at the next meeting. Sounds good. All right. So table that. Um, item number three on the agenda is appearances. It appears we do not have any. So we'll skip past that as well as unfinished business for which there's there are no items. Um, and we'll move to agenda item number five, which is new business um, review and discussion of the 2021 through 2025 parks and open space plan. All right, with us tonight, we have Blake Thyssen from Parkitecture. I think everyone knows Blake from previous projects. In your packet is included a, a summary survey result from our park and open space plan. This is all elements required as part of our five year update. Um, through that input, uh, previous uh, committee meetings and discussions, um, we gave Blake some information and he came up with a draft plan. So tonight, Blake's going to run through the plan uh, just briefly. Uh, really, for this committee tonight, it's just kind of talking about the goals and objectives and any edits Blake needs to make to the document. We will then have it published and available for people to view online have public input at our next meeting and talk about individuals. So not necessarily talking about individual updates to parks tonight, because we want to try to keep this under two hours if we can, um, but really more on the goals and objectives parts. And then like Alderwood had sent me some like grammar, people's names spelled wrong, all that sort of stuff is great to have that Blake can update. So um, just quickly, we had a pretty good turnout, I thought for the open space plan, 541 respondents. I did email you guys a link over the weekend if you wanted to look at the individual uh, comments, um, which is can be you know uh, entertaining at times. Um, but I think it falls in line with our our last time we did public input as well on some of the deficiencies in the system. So uh, without further ado, uh, Blake, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, guys. Nice to see you all again. Um, what I want to do tonight is just kind of walk through the document. Um, we know we still have some holes. There are pieces and sections highlighted in yellow, and there are some uh, sheets that are still um, uh, seeking some information. I'm hoping actually that's some of what we'll get from you here either tonight or in the next few weeks uh, in terms of the recommendations and ideas you might have for some of the individual sites. You know, we, we see the sites uh, kind of a snapshot in time. And we always try and pick really terrible days to be there, especially after heavy rain, so we can see where there are drainage issues and some of the, the physical problems on a site. Um, we don't often get there on beautiful sun, shiny days uh, where everyone's loving the spaces. I view a corp as a way to um, uh, bring forward some of the issues and challenges in a system, not necessarily to brag about how great your system is. A corp can do that, you know, uh, take that approach and say, hey, our system is perfect. Look at all the great things we've done in the last five years. And I think there's value to that. But I also think that that for you, this is a tool to, to go to council and, or, and, and grant um, sources and say, hey, we have some needs. And we've identified those needs, prioritized them, and we need some help to get that stuff accomplished. So that's how I view this document. So don't feel as you read through it um, and listen to my explanations that I'm picking on the Monona Park system or uh, I have issues with it because that's obviously not the case, but I'm just trying to help you get the tools you need to get some funding for more improvements. Jake, I need to be able to screen share, please, sir. Thank you. All right. Can you all see the screen? Nodding heads, yes. All right, perfect. So I'm gonna go through this in a, um, a two page view. So as if you had your book open in front of you on the table, you can see both the left and right side. So this is how it will appear. Um, and Jake mentioned I have some misspellings and grammar issues. All that is, is good input to get back. We need to make sure that is right. Please don't take it personal if I misspelled your name. I, my apologies. 
Um, the, the document is broken into five sections, so five chapters. So we have our intro, which is what we'll spend um, a bit of time on tonight. Some of the background stuff that is um, largely tied to your comprehensive plan, you know, the physical characteristics and makeup of the community. Um, chapter three is a little bit of the analysis of the facilities and how that relates to the national standards that we kind of benchmark against. Um, chapter four starts talking about our recommendations. And I always break that into two sections. One is general, kind of big picture, system-wide stuff, more high level. And then we um, spend a lot of attention on the individual park recommendations. And as you know, over the years, we've been systematically plugging away at a lot of the different facilities in the park system, making those improvements. So in many cases, there are very few things for me to to highlight as, as problematic or, or issues, which is great. Um, chapter five is where I tell you how to get it done, you know, and how to find money to pay for those ideas. So again, chapter one is the intro, um, a real quick overview of what the, the highlights are here in the plan. And then we get into goals and objectives. And this is, again, what I want to spend a little time on, um, whether it be tonight or um, you, know, you individually, if you have thoughts and comments about any of these, let's get these dialed in because this is really important that we get right. Um, and Jake had sent me a, a couple of, of goals that were framed out. I added in a couple more. We, we've got a couple of things that we observed and felt that were important to integrate. You know, obviously water recreation is huge in the community um, and continuing the focus on improving the bike and ped. Oops, I see a spelling mistake there. Um, bike and ped system throughout the community is, is very important. So this section kind of highlights the, the pertinent pieces of some of the other uh, relevant planning documents and you know, extracting some of the ideas that are um, of similar value to the core. Obviously we had the, the previous, um, the, the comp, comp plan, we have the sustainability plan, bike ped, um, the, the state outdoor rec plan, and actually Jake and I talked about adding in the Dane County open space plan. So that'll get added into this document the next time you see it. Um, so I always try and highlight here when we started and what the target end date is. A corp is a viable document for five years of planning. And every five years, the Wisconsin DNR requires that to be uh, renewed to be eligible for grants. Um, and there are other agencies that have similar requirements. But as you can see, I have a placeholder here to, to integrate some of the dis discussion points from the survey. You know, at the time I, I wrote this, I didn't have that, but we'll, we'll get that in and um, feather those ideas into our recommendations. So moving into chapter, chapter two, again, it's kind of some background on demographics and physical um, stru uh, structure of the community. One thing to note here, all of this data is based on 2010 census. The, the 2020, even though it's compiled, they haven't released it at a neighborhood um, uh, census block yet until uh, next spring, which doesn't do us a ton of good. So we're going off 2010 data because that's the, the level of uh, accuracy that I need. So again, some of the physical elements of the community, I won't belabor this point too far. If you're interested in soils, there's some discussion about your predominant soil types. As you know, wetlands and floodplains are a big issue in Monona where we have a lot of water in the community uh, and that water can be beautiful and fun for recreation. It can also be problematic. Uh, as many of you probably recall the floods we had a few years ago. Um, so it's important to, to note that. And as we look at some of these conservancy areas and even some of the main parks like Winnequa, you know, the dredging efforts that happened and will continue to happen, it's very, very important playing into some of these, um, these natural uh, behaviors. 
the woodlands, we have a lot of really beautiful uh, open spaces, very uh, passive recreation, nature-based spaces. We need to make sure we preserve those and enhance them. All right, and into chapter three, some of the analysis. Here we break out your parks by type. And when I talk about types, that's all related to the NRPA classification system. So your mini park is the smallest scale, which has a service area. And you guys have been through this before, you know a service area is that circle um, that you would reasonably expect a visitor to walk to that facility. So the distribution of mini parks throughout a community is, is pretty important. You know, that's where we we have our, our toddler play areas and our casual neighborhood gatherings uh, or family gatherings. So these spaces become really important. And in the, in the case of Monona, several of them are located right on, on the water's edge. Neighborhood parks takes a step up. You know, our, our size increases to a range of three to 10. Obviously with a bigger space, we often see a much greater offering of recreational uh, facilities. Moving up from there are community parks. And um, these are the biggest of the, the community. We expect that most people are gonna be driving uh, to these parks. While we love it, if they can walk or bike, um, usually the facilities that are offered in a park of this scale are a drivable or a destination type of uh, a facility. Special use typically are either a, a single or maybe a, a a double use of, of parks. So the dog park is really your only example where the only reason you're gonna to go to that site is to exercise your dog. You now, other times we might see a special use park, um, a skate park, for example, if it's uh, a standalone facility that would fall into this category. In your case, the skate park is located within a larger community park setting. Open space and conservation, as I mentioned, we have a couple of those here in Monona, um, really some beautiful sites and then some that uh, are so large in scale, it's very hard to get our hands around, when I say our, I mean as a, as a group, what to do. You know, the Wetland Conservancy is such a big area, um, really out of any of our physical control, but we need to be aware of its importance to the open space system in the community. Um, Blake, I'm sorry, I, maybe you just want to go through everything and we interrupt later, but I didn't see any of our um, Native American mounds mentioned in this portion. I don't know if that falls under a different section or a specific different heading that should be included, but I wondered about, you know, the possibility of having those historical um, landmarks included in the, as, you know, mini parks or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they, I don't, I think you're absolutely right. We need to um, catalog those somewhere and, and discuss the importance of those, but I'm not sure they would fit into that kind of broad bucket of the National um, Park and Rec Association's classification. Got it. But I think, yeah, if we can find the right home for it, absolutely. Thank Jake, you. Jake, are you helping me by taking notes here tonight? Uh, Molly, the Indian, it should be Indian Outlet Mound. Right. Uh, it's under open space and conversation. And the okay. other burial sites are within one of those parks. I, you know, Woodland Park. Uh, right. Potentially signed up. Monona Mound. I know that that was formerly Rindall Mound. That was just another one that I wondered about with the outlet. And, but I don't think that's on public property, though. So, yeah, we'll have to go Good through. Good point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Great. I appreciate that. I appreciate that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No, it's an important piece of the, the community for sure. We don't want to gloss over it. We'll just make sure we get it in the right spot. Um, so boat launches, obviously we've got um, three uh, nice facilities and they're all, they're all new, which is great. Um, really good public access to the waterways. Then in terms of uh, bike facilities, obviously the, the lake loop is a big one, it's not all yours. You share it with your friendly neighbors in Madison. Um, and it's really not an off-road facility per se, but it's worth mentioning because it is so popular and the connection to the other trail systems within the, the Dane County regional setting is, is really critical. Obviously you witness a lot of bike traffic on that loop. 
Um, and one of the things Jake and I have been sort of batting around is, is there a possibility of making some additional connections through some of our, our open space and conservation areas? So be interested in your feedback on that. So the park uh, service area, as, uh, let's see, am I in the wrong? Sorry, I'm just checking myself here. All right, so park service area, as I mentioned, each park type has uh, a different circle and I'll show you the map here so you can get a handle or a feel for what those service areas look like. So when you overlay them, you can see the yellowish circles are our mini park service areas. The green circles are um, the neighborhood scale. And then these blue circles would represent the uh, community park service areas. So you can start to see there are some gaps. Uh, ideally, you would have overlapping coverage of all different classification types. Um, one of the things that is so unique about Monona is that you're, you know, you're surrounded by Madison, which has a, a pretty good uh, quantity of, of parks. And you know, the average park user often doesn't know and probably doesn't care who owns or operates that park that they call their own. And so while this paints a picture of you know, some gapping in here, which I do want to talk about, um, I'm not overly concerned, you know, your municipal boundary, this black line that's out here, a lot of that is commercial. In fact, all of it is commercial. Um, so having a gap in coverage in a commercial zone really doesn't matter. Um, any of the residential here along the lakefront is covered by City of Madison um, park spaces, but again, not within the City of Manila's boundary. But we will talk about this space a little bit here. Um, I do see that as an area that we might want to address moving forward. Um, you know, that, that's in the vicinity of um, uh, the, the current bowling alley, just to get your, um, your, your sense of, of place here. So that is a spot that potentially if we can find some land, maybe as part of that development project moving forward, it might be nice to carve out some space for another mini park somewhere up in this region. The only real opportunity, uh, let me zoom in here a little bit. There is the elementary school right in here, uh, where am I at? Right in uh, here, sorry. So there is some recreation value that happens on elementary schools, you know, and again, the average child or user really doesn't care if it's school or municipally owned, but um, that's really the only spot uh, in that area that, that currently provides recreation. Uh, so we're still calculating some of the, the total acreages, so that's why these are highlighted. I'll get all that figured out so we can compare how you benchmark against the um, national averages. I don't get too hung up on these numbers. It's just one of the, the benchmarks, but every community is different. I mean, Monona and Los Angeles and you know, Hoboken, New Jersey are totally different animals, yet they all get put into the same melting pot of numbers. And so, you know, we, we like to provide it, but again, don't get too hung up on these numbers. So. Uh, okay, chapter four again is the uh, recommendation section. So I talk a lot about some general big picture things. Obviously, COVID has impacted how all of us use our parks and open spaces significantly. And I think it's uh, actually a real, real positive because we're seeing more funding get pumped into this as some of our elected leaders become more aware of the value of our open spaces. I talk a little bit about some of the, the policies and uh, sort of best practices here with uh, infrastructure, right? We wanna make sure we have proper lighting, bike racks are very, very important. Obviously we have safety first. 
Um, but things like the wayfinding and signage, you know, there's uh, some pretty good consistency in branding that you guys have implemented in your park system. Uh, obviously, the uh, the concept of the Adirondack chairs in all of your parks, everyone knows that's a Monona Park when they see it. So, you know, trying to build on that that brand for your system is is really uh, really good. So here uh, we talk a little bit about some future spaces. San Damiano obviously is a hot one. Um, and then that second parcel that I had mentioned um, up by the old bowling alley, I think we need to have some, some further discussion and, and include that, uh, that, that piece in here. Uh, this next section talks a lot about the existing bike and ped system. And you know we've got some of the maps from your um, bike ped plan here showing uh, the importance of all, all of those. And as we move forward here into the individual sections, just to give you a little bit of sense of how I organize this, each park has two pages or sometimes more. Um, we get a little space here to catalog your existing amenities. So your, your assets, if you will, um, what condition they are presently in at the time of the study any issues of, of particular concern, if it's flooding or you know, if you have um, a bleacher set, for example, that has rusted planks and you know, safety concerns, we always highlight those. And then we always give you um, our thoughts on ways to improve the site or fix some of the issues that we've raised and then an estimate of what we think it's gonna take. And you'll notice in all of the individual estimates, there's never a dollar value less than 500 bucks because it's pretty hard to get anyone to show up to a, a site for less than 500 bucks, no matter how small the problem. And some of the issues that we have seen are probably also better suited for in-house crews to handle rather than you know, trying to, to hire it out. So Jake, do you want me to go through all of these or, or just ask if people have specific parts Let's to talk through or? Let's pause because I think there was a couple comments or questions on some of the previous items. I mentioned. Sure. At Hallheader and up there and go through previous sections for. Okay. Okay. Um, just the question or thing that I, I wanted to, to point out on the, the map of where you have the parks identified by, by the circles by, by, and by the letters. Um, B, you have identified as Cold Springs park is a mini park but on the list of parks that are broken up that park is not mentioned okay uh this list this one yeah so if you go to to oh it is on there okay i kept looking for that and wasn't sure on the name so never mind it is included yeah is that, i, I hit it up here on you sorry about that that's just a little viewing area and i did see it in the picture too. So I just wanted to make sure it was, was included. Okay, thank you. Looks like it is. Thank you. Blake, you had uh, talked about some of the kind of the desert areas in Monona where there's a, a lack of parks and such, uh, but you, you mentioned at, you know, some of the, the schools, you do have the equipment. You know, I'm wondering, about you know with your map if you could broaden your map including the parks that are close to Monona and its borders uh, some of the uh, the Madison parks but also for the map just even with Monona uh, having IHM listed having you know Maywood listed you know showing where there are the the play equipment uh, locations in the the city um, you know, a lot of people who live here and who've lived here for a while certainly know where they are and they, they go there and, and uh, take their kids there. But for somebody new coming in, that might be beneficial to have all of that listed on the maps, kind of bordering sure. Madison parks and playgrounds, IHM and, and other places where there are some recreation fields and equipment and such. Yeah, I mean, I have them in, in green coloration. Uh, shown. Uh, I don't have them in a, a table format. I mean, there are there are a lot of those. 
Um, the other reason I don't usually catalog them in the report is that Jake and, and this body has zero control over what happens in those spaces. Um, I, I do think that I could add a category here for the schools within the, the Monona boundary. Um, might this map map might get a little cumbersome if I start cataloging all of the city of Madison spaces? That's my only concern there. But let me let me look into it. Um, are we choosing not to include San Damiano in the community parks because it's just not thoroughly fleshed out yet as a public recreational space? Or I just noticed it was absent from that so list. I have it included in our future. Uh, where am I here? Yeah, in our future park discussion, just because it is so new, it hasn't been planned out yet. I didn't want to pigeonhole it into a classification until we have a better idea of what that's going to uh, actually be. Makes sense. So, Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I sort of struggled with that. I didn't know where it belonged, but I ended up putting it here. Any other questions on the front end sections? Uh, Blake, I guess, you know, something else to include would be, we have a lot of, uh, you know, canoe kayak racks and, you know, that might be something to have listed also. We have the listing for the boat launches, which are certainly different than having a, a kayak and uh, canoe rack, but that also indicates water access for the parks. And so that might be something to also include in, in some type of a narrative. Okay, good, I like that. And then with what you have up on your screen now under chapter four recommendations, you have a kind of an editing error where you have a sock oh. prairie area. Yep, I do, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I, I, I have fixed that already. I'm not sure if I have a slightly different version open here. But Jake, yeah, Jake pointed that out to me last week and I had missed that. So sorry about that. Sure. Jake, that was corrected in the version I sent to you last week, correct? I don't know. I didn't read through it all. Um. On that page, the picture of the couple on the blanket, that's not a Monona Park, is it? Or am no, I it is not. It is not. Okay. Are you going to use more photos of our actual parkland for things like that, for the little insets? Um, I certainly can. I've tried to use as many as I could. This this one it was tough. It's just such a perfect image with the social distancing. I, I thought it really fit well, but um, yeah, I can... I can go back through here and see where there are other opportunities, but um, yeah, I'll work on that. Great. Um, I also want to give a, a compliment while we're kind of giving corrections and uh, constructive criticisms right now, but I, I thought this was a really beautiful document. I kind of want somebody to read it to me at night just to like go to sleep to because it just really beautiful language just about the landscape and, you know, the way that all of these different things intersect. And I thought it was kind of a very lovely way to, to talk about our city and our, our parks. Um, so I appreciated that. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, and, and I do appreciate the constructive criticism. This is a draft. I know I have holes and things that I've missed. So please uh, help me find them and let's make this perfect for you guys. Uh, Jake or, or Blake, um, What's the plan going forward for when it's going to come back or how many times it'll come back to the parks board? Um, what I envision is separate meeting in October for public input, um, unless we can, well, yes. For the timing wise, our next scheduled meeting, I plan to be in person on site at Stonebridge to start because it'll be finished by that point. And then we may have one or two agenda items. I'd like to focus one meeting on public input. So between like now and let's say two weeks, if you have edits that you've seen to the document that just factually incorrect or um, referencing you know, different city pictures, whatever, 
Blake will get all that done and we can publish it and say, this is the draft plan. Here's the results from the survey. Feel free, you know, we will do one public hearing um, and then probably we'll have, I would say, a discussion at the October parks meeting, if we can do it before, recommendation at the November meeting uh, for council to consider at probably the second November to um, adopt. So I'd like to have this either at the second November council meeting or the first meeting in December for the city council to adopt it. Okay. Um, yeah, my I had gone through at least through the goals and objectives part and sent comments to Jake, which I believe he forwarded to you, Blake. Um, so that, and it, you know, it's a long document, so I I wouldn't try to sit down and do the whole thing at once. But if you have if you do have comments, I think that's a, a good way, like small, you know, little comments that maybe aren't worth bringing up in the meeting, but um, so, and obviously I think the sooner you can get those uh, back to Blake and Jake, the better, so. It, yeah, it is a long document. I, I admit, and I apologize there, you have a lot of great facilities and it was, fun to include all the photos and discussion of it. So um, as you have probably found, you know, chapter four starts on page 32 and goes on and on and on <laughs> here until we get to about a hundred, page a hundred. So there's a lot of information here. And I, I have some questions for you guys on some of these parks. So I really want you to to look at some of the areas where I've either highlighted or left um, things in, you know, blank or, or blue. Are these things important to you or do you have other ideas to feather in? Um, you know, Ahuska, obviously there was, there's been various master plans put together. I did one a few years ago that I think had some legs. And so you know, Jake and I talked about, all right, do we start to prioritize some of those recommendations from that master plan and set some time, uh, some, some goal, some time goals to get those done? Uh, obviously, you know, Huska is a big animal, lots, lots to tackle there. Here's the plan I did for you guys a couple of years ago with the parking expansion and the trails and the expanded shelter. So again, um, some of your facilities are so new, there was nothing to really recommend. Obviously, Grand Crossing is a beautiful facility, brand new, uh, really no issues to cite. Winnequa is uh, another discussion. You know, there's a lot of different sub pieces of this park. And so the organization of this is still a little bit it's of a struggle for me. I'm trying, Jake and I are trying to figure out how best to convey the different areas, sub areas of the park. And um, each one has its own unique need. So potentially it's time in the very near term to actually look at this entire site and master plan it out and start to say, all right, well, all these different pieces have needs and how does that feather in? And given the uh, the likelihood of another planning effort for your community center and um, you know that's all gonna to tie into this so Jake do you want to talk about that timing or how that feathers in I think we'll want to overlay this plan with our five-year CIP that we'll have we do the whole actually next week and see how that looks. So I, I think we want to be realistic with where our funding scenarios are. Um, any inter, intermediate, you know, construction projects that could be done at Winnico Park in absence of a you know full scale developed master plan. I think if you recall from our our committee approved capital plan, we did include funding for um, reworking that entire path from Greenway. Uh, we're looking, you know, in the next five years for the project at Maywood, which is a couple uh, stormwater project. Uh, there may be flexibility for, you know, one more smaller size project in the next five years. Um, I think with the construction of a public safety building funding, it's going to be pretty tight. So we're going to really want to prioritize um, what we can do in the meantime. And, you know, I guess from my perspective, I'd love to see a completed 
master plan for Winnico Park in the next five years, a completed master plan for any improvements at San Damiano, um, and the successful master plan and construction project at, at Maywood Park as part of the stormwater project. But Winnequa, we've got, uh, yeah, Blake put in a few of those. And I think, Blake, we did, we missed the, um, your pergola from way back in the day. Yep, uh, that's right. You need to put that's the pergola one. in there across from Fireman's Park. I still have the, some of the wood for that. So uh, we have all sorts of different ideas uh, for various sections of the park. And, we, you know, that's going to take some time and effort, I think, as a community to, to go through. Yeah, so right. let me just throw in here uh, on the San Damiano, we're having the first steering committee meeting, a joint, the joint committee with the city and uh, the friends group. That's tomorrow. So obviously we're not going to have gone very far down the road by the time we want to get this plan done. But um, yeah, I don't know if I, I think it certainly would be deserving of its own listing in the this chapter four recommendations. You just, I mean, we're not you're not going to know exactly what the re recommendations are, I guess. But um, so you know, that's where we are with that. Yeah, and I, I think that site deserves a lot of attention here over the next few years. Of course, it's a, a, a major uh, financial purchase, a beautiful property, and a huge asset to the community. So it needs to be planned right. Um, I, yeah, I could see adding maybe its own section here. Uh, I think you're right. Within two months, we're not going to have a ton of direction on what it wants to be. But maybe it, 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 it at least deserves a page of photos of the existing assets. Right, to highlight the beauty of that site and the, and the potential that it could become. Uh, so this site for Aldo, obviously the city owns the land, but really doesn't have any control over the facilities. So struggling with what to do on this one. And Jake and I will work out the nuance there, whether it gets its own sheet or we just kind of list the property. Um, here's Indian Mound Park we discussed. You know, again, if, if there are recommendations on what you want to do, uh, how to maintain it, certainly let me know. Um, the conservancy, again, is such a big, big piece of land um, with very difficult management practices. I don't even know how much of that the city undertakes, Jake, or is it county or is it kind of hands-off management? Yeah, we don't do much on the wetland. Yeah, so I don't know if there's potential to try and sneak a connection through to some of the bigger trail pieces. But we can keep looking into that. Yeah, I think that that has been brought up, you know, possibly figuring out a way to connect, connect a trail going maybe along the ed western edge of the Wetland Conservancy and connecting it down to the Cap City Trail. Yeah. But there's a lot of challenges with doing that. Yeah, I went for a little walk the other day uh, trying to get my head around that corridor, and that's a tough one. <laughs> As you know, not an easy project to undertake. Uh, Woodland Park, so I'm actually meeting with uh, our friend John on Thursday to talk about some improved signage out there and you know the, the project that we designed for you last year is now implemented with that parking lot and the trail improvements which hopefully you've been able to visit um, already now that it's done turned out pretty nice I think but John has been great at plugging away at improving that that nature based space a uh, lot again is done a um, few little cleanup issues here and there but overall in very good condition and then the two boat launches are, are very recent. We have a nice leaning, leaning tower of yellow out here, but uh, you know, get that. The dog park, so that's another tough one. I understand that it's kind of a temporary site if, if it ever needed to be converted. So I don't know how much investment we want to put in it, but maybe a small shade structure, maybe some crushed stone pathing, uh, some picnic tables. 
Uh, and then wrapping out, yeah, so page 107. So that was what, 75 pages of individual <laughs> recommendations, lots of data there. The, the plan is rounded out with chapter five. We tell you how to do it. And then there is some uh, information on, on grants uh, through here. So, and then I'll have a couple other maps here when we're done, but that's, that's the document. Any other comments on the latter half of that? Yeah, Blake, can I ask you just a comment? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and Andy, a couple of years ago, and I did pretty extensive look at Woodland Park and um, Aldo Leopold, the connection between those two. Okay. We were talking about trying to like look at that as a, a feature. Two of the things we thought um, would be inexpensive and worth doing um, in terms of a hiking trail, we, we've improved the, tail, the trail signage in Woodland Park, but there's an obvious connection between Leopold that would be pretty easy for us, I think, to map out and, and provide signage for, for people that are hiking. Um, one of the things we found, for example, is if you went and asked all the Leopold um, staff how long some of those trails are, they haven't been measured in years. So mm -hmm. they, the response I got was, we really don't know. I think that'd be a nice thing to know if people are hiking or running or whatever in there. Um, and the other thing that Molly brought up earlier, um, Woodland Park, I think, and the Aldo Leopold are, are very significant in terms of um, Native American um, artifacts, effigy mounds. There's a huge one right by the water tower that we thought some signage there would make, would be a really good recommendation and a really good learning experience for people that are hiking through there. Okay, good. And again, low cost, sort of low cost things to do to enhance that park experience. Great, thank you. It would also bring Leopold and Woodland a bit more together, I think, in terms of being really parkland that's available to Monona residents. Yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll sit down with Mike and see what he's got for information about the trails on Aldo and see if, how we can feather that in. Um. I, this is more of a logistical question about the nature of how everything is classified. Um, but the, there's a new mountain bike kind of track at um, Maywood Park um, that is, I would say, like a one of the specialty, like a specialty area in the same way that like the dog park is, for example. Um, however, I know that that's very recent and also maybe expanded or temporary. I mean, I think depending on use and popularity. But I'm wondering about the inclusion of that as well as, you know, like, does it does it fall under a particular classification or could it be highlighted in a, in a certain way um, to really, I mean, that was a very special project uh, spearheaded by three um, young adults in the community. Yep. And so I think it might be useful to, I don't know how it would be included or classified, but. Yes, uh, I love that facility. I wrote it with my brother-in-law the other day, actually, and his, I remember my nephew who's uh, seven, which was great. You know, I love that. Um, so he, or sorry, it is included in the Maywood Park sheet, but I think you're right. We could probably highlight it in the discussion of bike ped facilities. Yeah, let's see here, mountain bike trail. Um, so it's mentioned, but not highlighted per se. Mm -hmm. So let me see where I can bring that in. You're right. Awesome. And, you know, we can, and Jake and, and, and um, Doug and perhaps the families or whoever you would want to consult could certainly bring in more details about how that came to be. And, you know, it, when it was brought in front of the council and all of that, because um, it was really a, you know, a, a community effort with cleanup and preparation and, you know, getting it ready to go. So um, I think that's a pretty special one. Um, and I appreciate you willing to being willing to take a second look. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would second that. I think it's also, I, my impression is it's pretty heavily used. So, pretty popular. There's Missy. Did you have something you wanted to say? I was going to say, hi, everybody chiming in. I Sorry, I don't I have my video on. I'm at a program with my stepdaughter. But we were recently um, awarded the park and rec grant through Dane Parks that we applied for. So there will be some future additions to that mountain bike trail as well that can be highlighted, obviously not in this um, plan since it won't be done most likely until the spring, but we were just awarded 13,000 for additions at that park. 
Nice. All right, I will uh, I will add that in here. Very good. So yeah, guys, if you can take the next two weeks and go through it and then uh, maybe get a list of any comments back to Jake. And I think maybe the easiest way to do it is if you can just say on page 51, add uh, recommendation for new park signage or you know whatever it may be. That way we can dump it all into one spreadsheet and I can filter by page and you know just go through the document one time cleanly. That would be a big help for me if you could. Because I know what Jake's going to do. He's just going to hit forward on all those emails. Maybe Jensen can help us out, Jake. What do you think? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, given I had emailed you guys, uh, Middleton and City of Madison's court plans, just if you want to review goals and objectives, if you're kind of like, I don't really like these, or maybe these don't quite fit here. Um, the other thing kind of in discussion that maybe we should just have a section about uh, the uniqueness of Monona and the different types of facilities that we have. So skate park, ice skating rink, mountain bike trail, outdoor pool, dog park, you know, like just a one page kind of like, bam, here's everything that we have um, that relates to kind of these different areas. So people don't have to necessarily go and find them, you know, in the document, because I, I do think um, while we joke about it at times of a community of 8,000 people, I, I would challenge anyone to say that there's another community in, this, in the nation of 8,000 people that have what we have um, with the very type of facilities that we have and access to the lake. So I think that's something to be proud of. It's something we should celebrate. If we can have that on, on one page, it might, it might help drive some of that you know, future improvements. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think the, the home for it is right up front in the executive summary. You know, we can have that little blurb about, hey, here's what the plan entails. Oh, and by the way, page two is Monona unique. And then we just, we talk about all the great things that the community has. And, um, and Molly, to your point, maybe this is a, a spot where we can do a photo collage of all the cool things that are happening in the city and unfortunately, as you probably noticed, as you reviewed my document, I have a lot of photos of the crappy things because it was a really, you know, series of, of poor weather days. So if you guys have kind of the glossy glamour money shots, please send them along. And I would love to integrate those into the document. Okay. It, yeah, I like that idea, Jake, too, of, you know, calling out the special things in the parks. And that might be, you know, Maybe each of us could include in an email, you know, three or four things, or you know, or eight, I don't know, uh, things that you think make the park system and Monona special. Um, and Blake, it's it's a good thing. I think the document's long. It's because that's you know, it wouldn't be long if we didn't have a lot of really good stuff. So right. You know, and I made the comment earlier about I view a corp as a way to kind of beg for money to fix your stuff, right? But maybe we can also do our little brag section here in the beginning about the, the Monona Unique. So we can start off and say, hey, look at all the great things that we've got. And that's a selling tool for, for residents and for visitors. And then the rest of the document helps to build your case for, for further improvements. So I like that hybrid. Anybody else have any any uh, other comments or questions on the plan, Tony? Um, when do you want our input back by again? Uh, two weeks from today. Okay, would be awesome. Thank you. Um, me again, just very briefly, I'm wondering about in the section with all the plans, like the sustainability master plan and the Winnequa master plan, um, are, are we interested in including any of the university collaboration from 2017 as, as relevant to this project or to this document rather? Um, I may not be familiar with what you're referring to. What collaboration effort was that? 
I think it was 2017, there was a report done in collaboration. It's called CITY, University, um, which was, and perhaps, you know, Doug or Jake, if you know, know better than I do, because it was before my time on the council, but a collaboration with um, students at UW for potential enhancement of different areas in the community, one of which I believe was Winnipeg Park. Um, and then there was the South Broadway corridor and just different, it was basically bike ped um, and park space suggestions. Um, and I think that document lives somewhere on our website. Um, so I can actually look that up if you like and send it with my other recommendations, Blake. Yeah, if it's on the website, I'll find it. I, okay. I, Jake, Great. I do remember talking to you about that, I think years ago, and I probably overlooked it during this um, process. I, I, I think we should reference it because a lot of at least some of our staff recommendations and where we're coming from were a direct result of that, of that process um at different parks so it'd be good to, to include that in the plan as well great yeah they did i don't know many many reports for all different city uh departments but i think there were at least two or three that were specifically uh, parks related all right i'll find it and include it thank you Rachel, you've been quiet. You're absorbing all the information. Making myself off the mute. I am. I'm absorbing. And I will get back to you with feedback. I haven't prior to the call had a chance to go through this comprehensively. No, no problem. I'm just I'm just making or having fun. <laughs> uh, anybody else have any other comments? Otherwise, I've talked quite a bit. I'll be quiet. Okay, thanks, Blake. Okay, thank you guys. So then are we ready to go up, move on to the park or the budget discussion, Jake? Yes. Okay, 5B discussion recommendation of the 2022 Parks Pool Community Center Recreation Operating Budget on page 138. Right. Well, uh, thank you guys for uh, doing virtual tonight with having Blake and, and wanted Missy to be part of this conversation. Um, the intent is to be back in person. Um, but the 2022 in your packet, you've got some of the instructions that we got from Mayor O'Connor and our finance director. Um, and then the next page is just kind of a the Cliff Notes version from myself on what this budget entails. Uh, I can report uh, happily that um, the city council approved the uh, increase of hours for a, a year long position to full time status uh, for the recreation program. So it's a recreation coordinator position that uh, will greatly help the department overall, but most specifically, it's funded 100% uh, out of the rec budget as part of the after school and summer camp program. Uh, so that is included already in the 2021 uh, budget. Uh, we've had uh, a phenomenal year financially and program participation at, at the Minota Bank River Rink, the outdoor pool, and our summer and uh, now after school program. So I, maybe the best in my 14 years, I would say. Um, so uh, Missy's on the call, huge credit to her and what she's done with her staff at both the ice rink and the outdoor pool. Um, Jensen uh, with the after school program and summer camp and now Brandy who will be our, our new full-time person. You have seen her around uh, and, and Jessica um, Walsh who is title right now is administrative assistant, but in our department titles, I just, we all do whatever it takes. And I think in the last year, she among all of us has uh, shown that whatever challenge or whatever we needed done in the department, she's been able to do. So uh, as we go through ones and zeros on the budget, um, I, I, I am so proud of our staff and what we've done uh, to be able to impact this community during the year of COVID with the support of this committee. Uh, it's, it's been a long haul. It has been a challenge. Um, we are tired, but we are very 
grateful to be able to serve this community. And I think this budget in 2022 does that. It also addresses um, some of the challenges that we're facing with uh, staffing and compensation and how we can address that and what the market rate is for uh, um, fee participation. So in our budgets that we have parks, rec, community center, outdoor pool, in the notes, I just wanted to highlight that our, our two revenue sources for parks are not included in the parks budget. And those are lake access permits and park shelter rental permits. So let's go to the general fund all comes out of the general fund at some point, but it is good to note that those are revenue producing activities uh, through the parks department. Lake access permit, actually we budget for $21,000 a year. If we collect more than that, it goes into a, a revolving trust agency. We actually owe that account about $60,000 because that's what we uh, designated when we redid the um, launches in 2018. So the Tony Watha Trail and Winnipeg Trail. So I think you're, year to date will be over that, but we'll just kind of keep paying that back. That was just a, a funding mechanism of how we do that. So um, lake access is always great. The money that you spend with Monona stays in Monona. All of, that money has to be spent on, on improvement and maintenance to those launches, uh, which it does. Park shelter rental uh, permits uh, were probably second highest in revenue in the county, just behind the city of Madison. Our fees are generally, uh, higher than all the other suburbs for rental, but we also have nicer park shelters and um, the other surrounding communities as well. Still this year was a, a pretty heavily um, demand for the use of those shelters uh, with multiple rentals uh, happening each weekend. Um, we're gonna, just gonna, I'm gonna go through each one. And then when Missy, if she's out of our program, we'll go on the pool, but we'll wait. So. And that last page on 141 just talked about the staffing of our department. So we're now back to seven full-time employees uh, for the department. Um, we do have job titles, but like I said before, we all kind of do whatever it takes. Um, that new page 142, revenue to expense summary. This is something that I'm going to hammer on at, at council and for anyone to listen. The national average in, in the United States for park and rec departments is 28%. Uh, that means 28% of your expenditures, you bring in that revenue. We're at 50% in 2021. So we're almost double the national average in what we recover. Um, so when you look at our total revenue for those four categories, the total expenses, and then I even broke it out by um, personnel and non-personnel. So for 2022, uh, we're looking at a $1.5 million budget, approximately 71% of that is staff, um, staff and benefits. So that's a mixture of full-time, all of our LTE and seasonals. It's a staggering number, but it just takes that many people to do what we do. So we are the largest department in the city when you account for um, seasonal staff and LTE. And those are all people who need supervision. Those are all people who um, have different needs, different uh, abilities, different um, resources that they can bring to the city. So that, that does not include the volunteers that we have, the, the coaches, the John Travers of the world. Uh, it takes a lot to make this community park and recreation system run. Um, and we're very fortunate to be able to have kind of the, the supply of, of staff and volunteers and the huge demand that we have for those services. Um, so we'll start with the parks. I'll go, through, I'll go through this and then entertain questions or comments. Um, Parks has probably the biggest increase in levy from 2021 to 2022. What our finance director does is kind of goes from year to year on how much time our public works department assists the parks department and their time when they help out in the parks is coded to the parks. So as we continue to um, do tree removals, especially emerald ash borer in the park system, we get a lot of help from the public works department to do that. So that full-time salary and benefits has been shifted over. Um, there is an increase in the part-time wages. Uh, this is more of a wage increase um, than it is like number of, of seasonal staff uh, type of deal. Uh, if you've followed the, the Dane County um, labor market right now, it is incredibly difficult to find people to work uh, at, at any 
um, labor type of position. So we have to increase our, our compensation on an hourly rate to be able to get people in. The week nights and weekends are incredibly difficult. We started with six weekend duty uh, staff that are the ones responsible for cleaning the shelters and preparation of our, our rentals, uh, trash collection, we're down to two. Um, and you know, we're paying $20 an hour and we just can't find the people that want to, uh, to, to work to do that type of um, duties. So uh, as, we, as we go through and as we've had now two seasons with ice rink and what winter operations look like, um, that's where the part-time wages come in. The only other uh, major change or you know, minor change is we've got some additional funding allocated uh, with the anticipation of what it takes to ma maintain San Damiano. So that's uh, fuel, e equipment maintenance, um, park supplies, uh, the equipment and facility maintenance and repair budgets. Uh, I did double the portable restroom budget uh, from 2021 to keep having a portable restroom at um, Bridge Road Park, San Damiano, and then off season at Lattice. So those three sites. So I'm not proposing that we bring back porta potties at any other locations um, at this time. I will pause to talk about the parks budget. So you're looking for comments or questions? Yes, questions, budget? yeah. Just one thing I wanted to make sure I understood when you were in the introductory comments about our revenue to expense ratio, I think it's 50% and in most the average is like 25, meaning they only bring in 20 revenue equal to 25% of what they need, what they spend their overall budget. That's correct. Yeah. And we're at half. So yes. Um, so how does the what you so which one are you proposing? I guess it's a one percent increase or what? Or yeah, the, we, we were asked to do two. I just did the one. Um, so really it's the 1% increase uh, in levy. Some of these are a little bit more than 1%, um, but given, given kind of the, we have some full-time um, wage adjustments as well across the department that we've talked about with Administrator Gaddow or Human Resources and the mayor uh, and looking at historically um, lower than average or their peers as we, as it relates to Dane County. So that'll be a discussion at the council level about some of these positions. And, and frankly, our department is, is well represented in, in the compensation uh, amongst peers across the county. So we do have some compensation changes that affect some of that, that additional fees. In different departments, it, it's accounted for parks because we don't show that offset in, in revenue. Uh, we are proposing, I believe on page, yes, on page 144 of your packet, we have the fee schedule as well, which shows an increase in fees uh, for use of our facilities. Um, we'll have a discussion, I think probably a reboot of our special event. Um, we have another one coming down the pike, at least for a request for another run and race. Uh, and we'll have a review of what happened this year as for next year by, by year end. But some of those fees may be adjusted, you know, due to that discussion. So in each of them, I think I have the, the budget and then the fees for that, for that budget as well. So you're proposing $100 for the special event fee? That's the application fee. That's just to have us review it with the different departments. Okay. And then from there, we have this, the different a la carte of the size and scope determining how many shelter rentals you have to have if it's in Winnipeg Park, um, amplified sound, temporary structure, et cetera. Okay. That seems high to me. No offense. Just wondering if there's any portion of that that's refunded if the application is not, if the request is not approved. That would be a policy uh, directive, Alder Group B, that I think certainly we can do. It's just the amount of time that our staff takes to kind of 
get through that process of whether or not an organization is ready to go. Um, we want to make sure that we're not wasting everyone's time or that, you know, it's, there is a lot of emails and calls that happen before you see that on the agenda. And so we want to be able to make sure that our time is, is compensated for. Totally a valid and I think a valuable perspective. Um, are there, do you have comparables for other communities about that? I mean, are you pulling this figure from something specific just based on past need and demand or is it? Yeah, based on no, I, I compare everything to city of Madison. So our, our goal is to be in line with the fees that are charged by city of Madison. So if, if it's an issue of Monona is better to work with because we have awesome staff, that's fine. But if it's Monona is cheaper than Madison, so we're going to Monona, I don't want that to be the reason why events start and end here is just because we're cheaper than Madison. I don't know that, how many special events do we have in the park, like the runs? I'll have to I'll have to get that to you, but um, you know this this month we have a, a city sponsored a new five k the Ann Aaron's um, diversity and inclusion scholarship run on the eighteenth. Uh, that's coming off of the uh, Rock and Brews marathon half marathon on the fourth. On the 25th, we've got the special event Czar's Promise Dog Walk um, around the park and in the park. Um, we have our own um, fall festival on October 16th. We have the one that was supposed to happen on the 9th that got canceled, the Pink Pumpkin, Pink Panther, Pink Pumpkin uh, run that was canceled. And then uh, in the springtime, we've got um, Lake Monona run. Missy, I, am I miss, are you listening? Am I missing any? No, I think you covered them all with the um, addition of uh, Gigi's Playhouse adding in for 2022 and then a couple other races as well that are looking to put in applications. And I am just leaving program, so I should be home in like 15 minutes just to give you an ETA. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Um, we do have a meeting, a, a cooperative meeting with Dane County City of Madison tomorrow. Uh, this week, uh, the, the big item for the three jurisdictions is uh, whether or not to add a commercial use fee of our launches. Um, so I think, I don't know if we keyed in some of the, the barges that have been using our launches for um, shoreline work, uh, private property, Madison's had some instance of a jet ski rental company that has used the launch hundreds of times over the course of a year and taking up more time. So um, that'll be a point of discussion on whether or not we want to have an additional fee, um, you know, for commercial use or, or that type of use of a, a lake access fee. Um, the other fees are just increases based on, on, on time and materials. One of the COVID supply chain, it's really hard to find athletic field paint right now. Like the price has gone up and uh, it's just one, this weird stuff with, I don't know if it's all Suez Canal, you know, backup, whatever. It just seems like there's, there's shortages on a lot of different things. And so that drives the cost of, of those supplies up. Um, the shelters themselves, the rentals continue to be strong. Um, we, we have that over 150 people for the double, doubling of the fees. Uh, and then we have a little asterisk on temporary structure. With some of our Ahuska and Winnequa, uh, a lot of those require private utility locates. So you can't just call Diggers Hotline for free and have it located if you're putting a tent. Um, we have to have a, a separate company come out. So we need to accommodate, have those people that want to put up those larger tents pay for that fee as well. Otherwise, I think it's pretty straightforward on the parks budget. Yeah, any any other questions or comments on parks budget? 
Okay. Okay, we can move on to uh, recreation. Or Doug, do you want to do uh, a motion on each individual budget as presented, or just on the overall the whole thing? I I think prob well probably all all in one motion. I think and okay. Uh, the recreation budget on page one forty five. Did you guys following along on that, or do you want me to share a screen and have it? Okay, it's fine the way it is. I just have my second computer here. So the big thing that I want to show you guys um, on the rec budget, and in, in probably in 14 years, this has never happened, and one of the more the proudest I've been of the, the, the community response to what we've done, that 2021 year-end estimate highlighted in red, that means we're making 11,000. And now that may not be final and all the expenses, but right now, as I have it proposed of where I think we're gonna be at with revenue and expense, we're actually making $11,000 more than we're spending total, including staff, wages, benefits, everything, where the levy would have been 83,500 this year. So we're giving almost $90,000 back um, to the general fund based on the performance of, of this department and this budget. So that is a significant achievement um, you know, for this department. It may, we still have expenditures to come out of that, but the, the big things that we know of the revenues are that the after school program fees, which in 2021 included our full day virtual. So we created a school basically as our department, we offered a school within the city, some at below deck, some at the community center. Um, and then we transitioned back this fall to our, our normal after school, 45 kids. We had 20 on a wait list. If I had more space, we could, you know, have more. Uh, the summer, summer camp fees this summer were uh, wildly popular. We were able to add a couple different options. Um, the uh, special event revenues, that's where the beer gardens go. That's where the pictures with Santa and pictures with the bunny uh, fee-based special events go. Riverfront concessions, um, I'm estimating year end will be at 75,000, but the expenditures mat max match that ratio as well. Um, we're still the summer challenge down there outside of the ice rink at Grand Crossing is still figuring out how that's gonna settle in with the construction, lack of parking, uh, COVID, uh, activating that space is gonna be a challenge, um, at least in, in the short term. And we really won't know until we get next summer uh, if we have full parking available and no construction happening that we can program that park uh, realistically. Um, the expenditures match on the rec budget. So after school, uh, has a wages part-time for after school and then the after school program. So you can really just add those two expenditure lines up to what the revenue are. Um, and the salaries and benefits include that, that new full-time position that was approved. Uh, so in 2021, we are showing a reduction in the tax levy for the rec department uh, budget. And that was, I think, one of the, um, the discussion points at council was that you know, don't surprise us with an increase to the levy. It's actually a decrease. So we're looking at uh, about a $9,000 a decrease to what our, our levy is going to be on the recreation side. Uh, and that's all program fees. So that's that 50, 50 to 55% revenue to expense working itself out. And the two large programs that we have are the summer camp and the after school program. So, Jake, yeah, I, I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen red ink like that on where it's a good thing in an operating budget ever. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, is that you attribute a lot of that to just COVID effects or, because I can imagine somebody saying, well, then why can't you do that again? And you don't need me. <laughs> I don't I, yeah, I would, I would love to. It was it was severe expenditure restraint. Um, 
like, don't buy anything. So use whatever we had. Um, okay. We're not, we were not replacing equipment or um, et cetera. So it, the, the, the restraint on expenditures were significant. I, I think this is still a process, especially with Grand Crossing and, and looking where those numbers come in over a three-year average. Yeah, the goal is to keep reducing that levy. I don't want to give any of it back, quite frankly, because I still think we could use another full-time position and having two full-time positions that can run programs year-round and help in different areas of the department. Um, we want to do what's best for the community on, on what we can provide and, and be as fiscally responsible as possible. But because our budgets are, are kind of coupled together in one aspect between um, the community center, parks, rec, and pool, a, a decrease in this levy helps offset an increase on the, on the parks levy. Uh, or the or the pool levy that you'll see coming up. So, um, yeah, I, I I think that the, the two large scale programs are sustainable over at least a decade right now with the, the composition of this community. Um, the other the other revenue producing programs we are fortunate enough to have the athletic field rental uh, revenue in the rec budget, the canoe kayak rental that we keep adding racks and and that helps offset with virtually limit you know low expense or no expense. Um, it, it was a big discussion point. This community has changed. You guys all see what the values of your houses are and the assessments and, and families that are moving into this community are, are typically dual working families. And so uh, we respond to the need of the community, you know, quite frankly, and, and, and that need has been under the childcare and, and full day type of programming. Um, we still are offering, you know, our free programs, our event-based programs, um, and we anticipate, you know, doing, being able to do a little bit more of that for next year. And I, I would anticipate we'll probably be back closer to zero. I just wanted to put in the negative because I thought it was, you know, when I was going through our, our expenditures, I was I'm pretty proud. It's a, yeah. it's a pretty big feat um, for, our, for our staff. Uh, I'm stalling a little bit for Missy to come back, but on the river rink um, on page 146 of your packet. Oh, are you there, Missy? I was going to say, you're going to have to stall a long time because the belt line is not moving right now, <laughs> going well. Right. Down. Don't worry about it. So, Just focus can, on driving. Can, Jump in I if can, you hear anything that's like blatantly, you know, incorrect. Yep. Uh, so the, the fee schedule we included for the river rink, our proposed fee schedule, um, we're adding, a, a, we did not in the first two seasons have a, a res, non-res fee um, for adults. And this year we are proposing to have a, a, a similar fee schedule that we do at, at the outdoor pool, which is non-resident adults five, Monona resident adults four, and then youth and senior regardless of residency three. And so that basically matches admission to the outdoor pool and then the skate rental per person. We have season pass rates in there um, that are, are mimicking kind of what the fee on the, the pool is. Skate lessons, which last winter were incredibly pop, popular and where we kind of saw the biggest jump from year one to year two was in those lessons. Uh, and then um, private rentals. Um, and we are offering or proposing to offer like a birthday party package where you have access at the indoor space. Uh, we are still gonna be doing um, pre-reserved time slots this year for the skate season, but also walk-ups uh, welcome as well um, because we, we won't have capacity restrictions, but I think we're looking at that 50 to 60. 50 is like, I think probably where our capacity would be for that rink, uh, 50 to 60. I think we got up to 40 last, last winter um, with COVID restrictions. And, you know, 40 is, uh, I would say on, on the not quite comfortable, you know, if you have 40 people skating in there at once, but from a revenue projection standpoint, you know, if you see it like the large Metro ice skate centers, you're just shuffling, you know, it's just kind of shuffling along. So we want to find somewhere where that happy medium is. Uh, we're sticking, like Jake said, with that kind of 50 per or 50 person capacity. 
um, with an hour and a half time frame for the skating um, for the skating reservations. What we found was it created that supply and demand kind of link and chain that we made the rink more desirable by having people pre-reserve and getting their spots. So on the flip side, we're hoping to just continue what we had going last season with really driving that demand at the rink that if you want to get to the rink and you want to skate, you have to pre-book that time frame, which uh, worked out really successful for us last season. Notice there's a big increase in the, the private rink rentals, both resident and non-resident. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that um, was due to the change in capacity limits. So the private rink rentals last year were only um, up to 25 people. And this year we're increasing it up to um, 80. So we just have more capacity to fit more people on the rink at that private time frame, which is for the increase in, in fee. We had to last year we had to last year follow the twenty five person capacity limit set forth by the mass gathering restrictions. So fingers crossed all goes as planned and we no longer have those mass capacity restrictions that we had to follow. So the pricing was kind of based off of that $4 per person at the $25 uh, or 25 person rental last season. So we're going off of the new price structure and the additional um, people added on the rink. Okay. And then the open rink birthday party package, is that, can you explain what that is? Yeah, so the birthday party package would give somebody the ability to um, utilize part of the concession stand will be reserved for the party. It would include um, ice cream. It would include hot cocoa uh, admission and skate rental for up to um, 15, uh, excuse me, 12 people um, per party which we had a lot of questions and um, demand for the parties last year, but since we didn't have any capacity to put them anywhere inside, we weren't able to offer that option. So um, it's basically taking the ease off of parents and providing all the fun and amenities for people to just come to the rink and not really worry about anything else. We also have a, a $25 upcharge if they would like pizza included. And then we would provide a, a large pizza from Rossi's as well. Um, Missy, how did you settle on the figure of 12? Are you anticipating that like potentially more than one party would happen at the same time? Or I'm just curious about the number of participants in that. Yeah, um, we were kind of going off of spatial awareness in the concession stand where we didn't want the inside concession to be overtaken by just a birthday party. So then we still had space for general public use as well. Um, so if you're familiar, which I think you all are with the concession stand, the back seating wall um, with the, the fence seating, um, if you have two six foot tables, you can basically fit 12 people in on that wall as a reserved space and then allow the rest of the concession stands to be utilized for that general public use. Sounds good, thank you. <laughs> yep. Missy or Jake, uh, what I'm curious about would be when your starting date is estimated to be and your ending date, and if you are able to open a week earlier, maybe stay open a week longer, how does that impact on the revenue that you bring in for the rink? Um, the projected date would be the Saturday before Thanksgiving, which off the top of my head, I believe is the 20th of November. And then we were able to stay open until um, March 12th last year. 
um, which March 12th was pushing it the last two days. We did get some soft spots on the rink and some areas that were unskatable, uh, but we also were hitting some warmer 60 degree days, which the rink is really rated up to like 50, 55. So we were, we were pushing it temperature wise on what the rink could sustain. Um, I would say there's probably about a, a two to three thousand dollar swing with an extra week on each side. The the uh, starting date is a lot easier for us to control than the, the end date. Um, Correct. The you know the the weekend before Thanksgiving is probably about the earliest by the time we start setting up and get temperatures and get the whole system going. Um, but that's also more popular to for revenue than in March. So even though they can all extend the skate season once that February time frame, so all of our programs are either December, January, or February. Um, as soon as that snow melted, we saw a drastic um, decrease in the participation in March. You know, the first fifty degree day. So we may end up you know, saying March 5th is like the last day. And if it's cold and we still see demand, we go. But if not, you know, that the minute we turn the pump off, we're not using a lot of electricity and, and we cut down on those expen expenditures. Um, just so we're all aware that the river rink, the way the budget works and how we have it expended, 100% of the electricity used for the chiller and the pump system are under the recreation river rink expense budget. So that meter, when I'm not running it, costs 350 bucks a month. So for nine months a year with MVE, that's just part of doing business. It's a very expensive, uh, you know, pump system and three phase power. The 50% of the gas and utilities, including the you know the fire pit and all the rink lights. That also goes on under, under the rec budget. Um, the, the maintenance staff uh, that's doing the Zamboning, our, our LTE wages goes under that budget as well. Uh, and then all of the direct line staff uh, to run that. So when we're talking about, you know, whether the rink makes money or not, you know, we are accounting for more um, budget stuff that we would typically do. Like if we were looking at a rec program, we're not accounting for, you know, Fireman's Park shelter rental money when we use that shelter for a program. But we're trying to look at the direct cost um, and, and where it goes. So I, I, I have a slight subsidy again this year. I'm confident, you know, given we want to see what kind of this post COVID November, December, if we have really strong to begin year three, um, we'll be able to kind of dial that budget in, you know, in 2023 or we'll start making, making a profit on it, but we have a fair amount of expenditures um, with the system there as well. We'll also be bringing in revenue this um, November, December on the ring budget in terms of concession sales, which was something we did not have in the beginning of 2020 since the concession stand um, area was unopened and it was a completely outdoor experience. Now, of course, with concession revenue does come concession expenses, but that is something that we were not able to secure in the first half of this year, which we're excited to bring back this year, since it was asked for a lot in the beginning of the year. Uh, we just weren't able to make that work with COVID restrictions. Okay, any, any other comments or questions on the rec budget? Then you wanna move, is it the uh, outdoor pool is next, I think. I'll start and then let Missy chime in because uh, you know, she should be, she is incredibly proud, but I'm so proud of her and the staff. I mean, we had a whole plan, COVID, masks, yeah, uh, chairs, no chairs, 
guards off for two seasons. June 1st, you guys, I'm pulling my recommendation, ripped that Band-Aid off and said, let's go. And sure enough, we opened the pool and it's hotter than heck and it's never stopped the whole summer. Hot, hot, hot. But just because it's hot doesn't mean a pool is successful. It's successful if you have great management and great staff and those staff work their tails off to bring back swim lessons to the community, to bring back private rentals, to bring back open swim. Um, the, the management, you know, and, and Missy, as you are all aware, is expecting. So, you know, being an expecting mother and being outside and being at the pool, um, I, it really was a phenomenal year. Uh, as far as from a revenue projection, when you look at the blue box, I should have made it that one red too, because the, the blue box on page 147, the subsidy is projecting out to be 57,000. Uh, the levy instead of 121. So again, we're we're netting sixty thousand dollars over what we were budgeted for, um, which is just phenomenal. It, we, we will see where everything comes out, but the the revenues are 100% uh, accurate. So sixty thousand in season passes, eighty eight thousand in um, daily admissions, and that number there could be an all time record from 93 on up. I, it is certainly the most amount of money that I've seen that we've brought in since I've been here in daily admissions. Uh, third, same with concessions. Um, the rentals are where they typically are with swim team and uh, lessons, you know, so we budgeted for kind of a smaller lessons. We were able to expand it. Um, and yes, I, I, I joke with my colleagues, my friends that said, I gauge success at the outdoor pool if no one drowns and no one dies at our facility. That is the number one, you know, so yes, that was, we, we, we did that too. Did we provide a, a welcoming and safe environment for our residents and for visitors? Yes. Three, did we make some money and cover our costs? Yes, we did that as well. Um, so Missy, if you're on, if you guys want to give Missy the kudos and, and the staff that we had, it, it, it really was a great summer. Bravo, Missy. Way to go. I got to I got to say it was all staff. They did a fantastic job like Jake said from day 1 we were busier than heck and it did not stop until the end. I will say I had a lot of very exhausted very um stressed uh, pool of lifeguards and staff but they really they stuck it out and there were days that they're like, can't we just stop letting people in the pool? And I said, no, 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 we can do it. And they did it and they really were fantastic. It, I couldn't have done it without the help of, you know, the, the 30 staff we started with down to the, the six that ended up working the last, you know, week of the pool. So it really was all due to part-time staff and what they were able to accomplish. So I got to put all my success to them. And Misty, just for the committee, what was our 2020 uh, lifeguard wage and then pool manager wage and what we're proposing for next year? 2020 or 2021? The, this summer, this summer's wages, yeah. yeah. Yep. So starting wage um, for first time guards would be $10. And then they got an additional 25 cents added on per additional year that they um, have worked at the pool. Uh, I had a head guard position that started at $14 an hour, um, which they had their, had their requirements of working three seasons at the outdoor pool and um, work 40 hours a week. Um, and then our pool managers were $17 an hour. So um, we kind of tiered it based off of experience and hours wanted to work. So the more hours you wanted to put in, the more money you made uh, as, as a lifeguard or a head guard. And we do have an increase for next year. Um, proposed in wages to help accommodate that. The, the challenge that we have is it's not just pay, it's staff 
wanting to work 40 hours. So it's not 1998 or 2008 or even 2018 anymore with how we all remember working all summer long in high school and college. It's, there's just not that many people that need, really, really need to work that crazy amount of hours, or they say they want to work that amount of hours, 40 to 50 hours, and then life gets in the way and they have family vacations and they're down to averaging 20. So I think our seasonal staff looks at an overall hourly wage and wants more and wants to be compared to Madison, but we have enough shifts, enough hours that even a first year guard can and work 40 plus hours a week at the outdoor pool. So there is some merit to um, what the wage structure is, but it's really a philosophy of, of where our age range of, of typical workers are and what they're comfortable with hours work with what their other life commitments are. And so having that head guard position, um, you know, that was, that that's a, I would more comparable to what city of Madison pays just sort of standard lifeguard. Um, and those would be kind of our senior lifeguards that are, are willing to work. But I mean, of the over hundred staff, I would say we had less than two hands of, of staff that really, really like, I got to pay for everything. So I'll take every shift I can. I'll work as many hours as I can. And that, that number since I've started has just kind of decreased where um, it's not necessarily a, a motivation of, of money as it once was. And, and so we have to be as, as creative as we can and try to create a culture of, of being, um, you know, productive and that, that role of, of, of serving our community. We have to solve different points behind and wage, but we, at the end of the day, we do need those lifeguards to, to staff the pool. Um, and so it, it was a nationwide issue this year, statewide issue. Uh, locally, we were the first, we were one of the first pools to open for open swim. And we were, us and Madison closed the last day. Uh, the other public pools closed, um, at least, Missy, correct me if I'm wrong, was there one, one day before us or was that, were they all the weekend before? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I just walked the, to the house. The other pools, Sun Prairie, Middleton, Cross Plains, did they all close the weekend before us? Yep, they all closed. So, the only pool that was open till the end of the season or summer season like us was Goodman. And yeah. this year posed a challenge unlike no other that high school sports seasons, the spring season went till the end of June, which was nothing our something we've never experienced before. So when Jake talks about that kind of shortage of hours and staff not really wanting to work, it was that they had other schedule commitments due to COVID scheduling and other, other outside commitments that they had prior to working. So the only caveat in this budget for next year, you can see the levy is, is basically flat. It's actually uh, decreased a little bit with the revenues and the expenditures. Um, we are investigating, we had a leak in water. And so that, that last water read to kind of get where that end, uh, if we can adjust that and get that fixed this year, that'll make a major difference. I, looking back at the actuals on, on water, I think this leak might've been years in the making based on um, how much money we're spending on water for the pool. Uh, that's going to be a challenge. And in, in the capital budget, we have pool painting as well. So um, the, the maintenance of the pool and the upkeep is going to be critical over the next decade as we start talking about um, you know, planning for a, a new aquatic center. There's certainly the healthy demand and use. Uh, day camp uh, group use has been uh, an incredibly um, good business plan for us where we have the groups in and the, the time allotment of having family swim time in the mornings on weekends and adult lap swimming, uh, very few have, have that option. So um, people can go ahead and look it up, but I would hope that you, you know, just trust the Missy and I are saying there are no other public pools that offer the amount of varied uh, swim times in the county than we do. And I think that showed with um, Missy, it's adult, the uh, daily revenue, 50% non-resident, correct? 
Uh, correct. Our our biggest money maker is adult non residents, and they come in roughly at like 30, 30,000. I think it was twenty eight five um, this past season, which is a, a huge number. And you can tell the difference. Jake mentioned family swim and um, weekend hours that we have. the The days that we are opened. Um, all day non swim team days. Our weekends, you know, projections on a Saturday are $2,500. And when we have swim team Saturdays, which is a great group to have, but we decrease our, you know, daily revenues to 11, 1200. So the days that we have those swim teams, we take a hit in our daily revenue, but we make up for that on the 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 rental side of things with the amount of money they bring in. But that Saturday early morning swim is really what that I would say two to seven year old family range is really looking for pre 1230 pre sun. And it, it shows in the numbers on the days that we have home meets versus not having home meets. New this year, we sold chocolate chop ice cream uh, at the pool concession. And I would say that was a big driver of concession sales is having just the alternate source of uh, ice cream availability and kind of streamline the, the rest for concessions. We did host the one day all city uh, swim meet um, here at the pool and we were compensated for that uh, for $1,000. And so that was like a seven to three. I guess all city is talking about potentially using that format moving forward. So uh, we'll provide that update with the board as we, we get more information from the, the Minoan Swim and Dive. Um, we did propose in the fee schedule increases across the board. We, didn't, we did not increase anything from 2019 uh, in fees. Um, and you know, so some are going up $5, some are $3, the, the, the daily is going up. Um, we're a little bit conservatively, uh, I'm estimating the revenue a little bit conservative for next year because I increased fees should actually increase the revenue a little bit more, but we wanna see if this is just a boomerang effect with COVID, if there was still less travel, less vacationing, more staycation coming to the pool or if this is just a trend um, in, in greater attendance you know, at, our, at our outdoor pool. But certainly the cost to operate the pool um, continues to rise. And so we need to, in order to keep that levy uh, flat, we need to increase fees. All right, I know, Jake, okay, you mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, Tom, did you want to, do you have a just comment? A comment? Doug, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry. I apologize, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, I think you had mentioned raising the, the wages for uh, lifeguards and others there, but I don't think you said how much. We, we'd be looking at a, a 12, 16, 20. So basically a $2 increase on lifeguard head guard and then a three on pool managers. I, this year we had very well qualified pool managers. They were older than any of the pool managers um, we've had in the past and they're very well qualified and to continue to offer that level of service. I think the only way we can do it is by offering that fee or that um, wage increase. So that two, $2 on the lifeguard, $2 on the head guard, $3 on the pool manager. Hey, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I just, Missy, I'm glad you just said that because <laughs> I wanted to give you and Jake a compliment. And I think um, living in a country where we're struggling with um, getting minimum wage in most of our states, kudos to you for <laughs> increasing their salary somewhat. But Jake, the other thing I heard when, from both of you is like employees that you're supervising are learning to serve the community getting things done as they arise in, you know, when we're in a uh, dealing with some real major health crisis and sharing praise and credit for a job well done. 
where my theory would be, and just take a wild stab here, all of that comes from really good leadership with that you and Missy are providing. So bless your hearts for sharing that. I think the job overall is well done, but all of that comes from good leadership, creating a culture that builds that. So thanks for doing that. Thank you, Tom. Um, I just been sitting on that for a few minutes. I wanted to share that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well said. Anything else on the outdoor pool? Okay, then is it community center next? Go really quick on this one. Uh, still no rentals, no private rentals for 2022. Uh, we are a complete program facility now with the recreation department and the senior center department. Um, if we want to, we are working with like Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, Monona based nonprofit groups to get them in um, where we can and where we have staff that can, um, there might be a slight fee for them just to cover some of our existing staff, part-time staff that can close up the building. Um, but not having the, the, the weekend events has been, um, <laughs> uh, for us full-time staff uh, that has to deal with that, uh, it's been awesome. Um, still with COVID and kind of the, the concern uh, over uh, exposure for our kids programs, we're still keeping it locked up uh, uh, to general public. We are getting uh, modifications as part of capital projects, door openers, um, locked doors uh, to get the kids back and forth. Um, same issue right now, we just got notified this last week, we're not getting any um, time at the Winnipeg School or Monona Grove School District for outside groups due to COVID concerns. Uh, we're kind of doing the same thing with the community center. So it's just really a, a, a budget that reflects where some of our staff um, salaries are housed, 25%, I believe of mine, just a percentage of, of Missy Jensen's and Jessica's and then the cost to, to run this building. Um, this is also, you know, for the whole building. So like the senior center doesn't, we don't cost share any of that. It just all goes under the community center budget for janitorial supplies, maintenance, et cetera. Utilities, everything's housed under community center for both levels. So there is no fee for fee recommendation for the community center at this time. Do you ever foresee a time when the the bar would ever come back? No. Yeah, <laughs> me either. Okay. It, it, not unless it's at Schluter Park <laughs> and <laughs> weekly beer gardens, then I would see a bar. Yes, but uh, it just. The space in a future building, I think there's discussion on, on the merits and benefits of, of, of doing that. I, I think there's third party organizations or businesses that could do a much better job at the, the, the wedding planning and all the things that go into that than you know, meeting park and rec people. Um, so I, I, I think with a new building, that's gonna be a great discussion to have on what services we can provide to the community. Uh, just kind of echoing off of that a little bit, but our, our main user groups that were renting weekend based um, parties were non residents. So when we start talking about community center use and benefiting the residents of Monona, we we weren't really doing that um, outside of some of the staff city appreciation events and um, a couple large scale community center um craft fairs that were open to general public, but we were basically running privatized non, non-resident rentals out of our building and subsidizing those events. Okay, any other questions on the community center budget? Okay, that's the last one, right? You're all out of budgets? Okay, good. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion?
I'll, I'll move to accept the budget that was presented to us for the, the three areas. I'll second. Any discussion? I would okay. just, yep. just to entertain Jeff's motion, budgets and fees and fee schedule as presented. Yes. Okay, uh, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, all right. We have eight minutes left, Jake, but you don't need to use all of them before we get the two hour limit. Um, I wanna say thank you on this, but as, as a mind numbing as listening to Missy and I talk about uh, budgets, trust me, we've been, crunching numbers and dealing with reports for like the last three weeks. So getting this off of my plate and sending it to the mayor, it's not my favorite time of year at all to be going through Excel spreadsheets and auto sums and throwing pencils and, you know, trying to track revenue and expense and all that. But anyway, thank you for our listening. This is actually, it's been a good budget year and, and good to look back and really excited moving forward um, with what we have to offer. So department report uh, at council last meeting, the, they approved the paving of the path at Winnicott Park, just from the skate park or from Winnicott Nichols Road to the skate park. So just the gravel section. Uh, so it's just gonna be kind of that fix what was there. Uh, I did indicate that that would be a priority project, uh, uh, at least staff recommendation in the 2023 capital budget to make improvements to the rest of the section down to Greenway. Uh, just today, actually, we had the four ash trees that were between the, the pool water slide and the Schaefer shelter removed. Um, so it's pretty significant, like visual change and kind of where a path can get shifted over. Um, the Stonebridge Park projects, uh, concrete sidewalk installation is about 65% done as of today. So they're working their way up the hill. Uh, council on the seventh with issues with the pagoda that Doug had emailed you out, uh, voted for demo, then Landmarks Commission the next day decided to table um, that demolition permit. So what that means is the pagoda is unsafe, it's not usable, it's uh, the foundation at this point, the park will be done, the pagoda will be fenced off uh, to try to keep people off of it until the Landmarks Commission, I believe, gets a second opinion on uh, whether or not it could be saved or not. Um, so the park will be substantially complete, uh, I would hope by next Friday, um, with seating and restoration tree planting, it, end of the month, let's just say, given a couple of other days. Uh, from the lake, I know Pat has sent me some pictures of it. Uh, I don't know if we can, how many signature parks we can have, uh, but I believe this will be another signature uh, park of ours in Minona. So um, congratulations again uh, to this committee and the design and five plus years of going through different process for this uh, park. I, I think it's gonna be a home run when people get to use uh, the park. Um, so Jake, on the, on the Pagoda, they, they felt like maybe they needed like another, an expert opinion on whether it could be saved or? I, that's how it was relayed to me by Administrator Gadow today. I was unaware, I didn't hear from uh, Doug Plowman, I guess on the meeting on Wednesday, I just, just assumed they, the indications from all the goal forth was that they were willing to accept a demo permit and then I believe some committee members um, wanted to get a second opinion on whether or not it could potentially be saved and pulled and put together. So um, okay. well. we, we will see, uh, we, we will see. Um, uh, the Rock and Brews Marathon went fairly well overall day of events. Um, we have the Ann Airhens one coming up and then Fall Festival on the 16th. Sorry, I'm just going through my notes here and anything else that I had for you guys. Our fall programs are in full swing. Rec again, uh, 
150 kids in youth soccer. Uh, flag 202. Woo. Oh, 202. <laughs> okay. Over 200 kids participating in soccer. Uh, beer garden. The last uh, one is next Thursday. Um, Tom and Evan. Well, the last official one is next Thursday, and we will see how the weather looks in Oktoberfest if we can maybe get one more in there. Uh, the one last, this last Thursday was really great attendance. The, um, oh, Missy band name, I can't, the two Minona residents, uh, Americana band, they were fun, uh, and it was a really good turnout there. Uh, I will be out of the office next week um, attend at our national park and rec conference, which is in Nashville. So be prepared to come. I'll be getting lots of great ideas for park projects. And, um, so I'll probably have a lot to, to share over trends across the country and, and hope to brag about Monona a little bit while I'm there. With that, I'll take any questions, comments, or concerns. Anybody, Molly? Yep, I'm, I'll try to make it brief. I know everybody's kind of, you know, uh, petered out at this point, but um, I wanted to just bring up again the possibility of potentially having a standing item on the agenda for DEI initiatives that we can potentially um, focus on at the end of every meeting. Um, I know that many committees have done that. Um, I love being able to have those conversations with this committee. Um, and one item that I would just, you know, kind of bring back up is we essentially laid out a pretty, I think, um, appropriate and well-resourced plan for the maintenance of the, the various Native American mounds in the city. Um, and if we could revisit that at some point post budget time, just to make sure that we are following best practices when we get back to mowing season fully next, next summer and spring, um, I would be grateful for that. Um, another thing I just wanted to check in about is, um, I know we received a comment, uh, an inquiry about the signage at San Damiano near the potential Ho-Chunk mounds um, and whether or not we could do something to just indicate that people should not be climbing on the, you know, whatever the, that special fencing is and um, making sure that we're, you know, doing our due diligence just with the potential of preserving, you know, these sacred spaces. So that's all I have to say. And thanks everybody for, I think a very, just another great robust conversation. I'm excited about the master plan and just being able to have everybody's feedback on that. So uh, thanks to all of you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Pat? Just, just one qu question and, and a comment. My question is, um, and this was in Blake's report, um, how our projected population um, from now until 2040 will drop by about 1,500 people. I'm curious where that comes from. <laughs> so oh, that, yeah, I, I think it's the 2020, the 2010 census that indicated the age of Monona. We had a, a higher than average uh, individual age. So the amount of seniors living in Monona by the time 2040 comes around, math tells us most of them will be gone uh, from this earth. Uh, and that we are just not repopulating, you know, family size is not as big as it was maybe 30 years ago. So I don't buy that. I think as the 2020, 20, 2020 census, I would anticipate our population will be closer to 8,500 uh, with the addition of some of the uh, multifamily. And so what that, what that doesn't really calculate is redevelopment and how we're redeveloping with, you know, 200 unit apartments and that might be a plus 400 or whatever it may be. So, uh, um, so I, yeah, I think it's mainly based on age and single family households. I don't see that. I mean, I don't think I'll be here in, in 2040 to see what the population is, but <laughs> hopefully be retired by then. Um, uh, so yeah, we will, the, the DOA state estimate this year was like 80, almost 8,200. So it's, mm. it's already gone. You know, it is going up. So yeah, it seems like they just took a line that, you know, it has been going down and kind of extended that to the future. But, 
All right, just curious about that. And then just thank you, Jake and, and Missy and, and your whole team. You guys do a remarkable job of putting together a group of people who want to work together and do such an outstanding job. Awesome, we're lucky. Yeah, I don't think you're, <clears throat> it's probably not appreciated enough until you're in a situation where you don't have that and, you know, realize what, <laughs> Yeah, what we have is great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, um, then any, anything else or a motion to adjourn? Uh, just quickly, our October meeting, uh, I had, I have one group that wants to present on um, smoking in parks or vaping. It's uh, the county alliance. I really hope that we can meet on site at Stonebridge. And so if there's nothing else pressing other than the, the I think we could meet first at Stonebridge uh, and with timing uh, that early October, I don't know when sunlight's gonna be, might be an issue, but we may try, I may propose kind of an earlier time to start so we can um, meet at Stonebridge and do a tour and then come back to like the community or to city hall to do an in-person meeting. You guys are okay with that. And then the, um, park and open space plan, we can decide based on where COVID's at if we want to do an open house or just do it virtual, but whatever we want to do for that point is fine. But most likely we'll have two, two meetings. You guys won't be obligated necessarily for the, the public input of the court plan, but the regular scheduling meeting, yes. Sorry, Doug. That's all I had. Oh. So do you need I, a motion to adjourn? Yeah, I don't, I think Doug might be frozen. Yeah, I thought I, I was frozen. <laughs> okay. I think a couple people are. Oh, well, but, well, hold on. But was Doug frozen or did you have, like, are you okay? Just a little checked out momentarily or <laughs> we're good? Doug, you're good? Okay, I think he's good. Just checking in, <laughs> just checking in. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Wrapping it up, starting it up, wrapping it up. I'll second that motion. Okay. Football All in favor, time. Doug excluded. Okay, <laughs> any, any opposed? All right, great meeting folks. See you soon.